start our webinar. I, this is now almost a cliche at the beginning of every event when I have to announce to myself and to our audience that the webinar is now live. So here we are again for another week of the lunchroom. I'm excited to be here as always. Uh, I am Sarah Schofield Manser. I am the American Repertory Theater's Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships. I use the she series of pronouns. I am a light-skinned white woman with shoulder length, dark hair. I've been describing it as shoulder length now for six months, so we'll have to revise maybe next week. Uh, I'm wearing a red button-down shirt today, and I've got some headphones in, as always, my trusty little headphones. So happy to have all of you. Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge that the land, the Loeb Drama Center, and Oberon Occupy is the unceded territory of the Massachusetts people, and that I myself am calling in today from the unceded territory of the Massachusetts, Penacook, Pantucket, and Wabanaki peoples. I encourage you all at home to investigate the indigenous land that you're calling in from today, and I'm going to drop a little resource in the chat for you to look at later on, just so you can explore a little more at your leisure. A few quick Zoom housekeeping notes. So our conversation will be about 45 minutes and we'll reserve the last 15 minutes of the hour as always for audience Q&A. We want your questions. So if you've got questions at any point for our panelists, please feel free to submit using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please note that that is different from the chat feature, which is in fact disabled. So you'll submit questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. One more thing to note, if you'd prefer to have some live subtitles and captioning today, there's an option for you to turn that on. There should be a button at the, at the bottom of your screen that says three dots and more, and it should give you the option to show a subtitle. It's an automated service from Zoom, so it's not 100% perfect, but it's pretty nice if you'd like to follow along with that. And then last but certainly not least, we have our audience compact statement that we read at the top of every virtual event. This compact is that the ART is unequivocally opposed to hate and that we center anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values. And as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings nor at our online events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and to discrimination. We're all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audience, and community are seen, heard, valued and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. So thank you for being our partner in it. I'm so happy today to be joined on the lunchroom by a fantastic group of guests who are all working on our amazing production of This Is Who I Am, which is now available again, streaming through April 25th. I'll put a link in the chat for everyone in just a minute, and you'll be automatically redirected to the website page as soon as this event ends, if you'd like to check it out more. But for now, I'm going to welcome our guest hosts and guest panelists to turn on their cameras and join me on screen. I've got Evren Ochikin, we've got Ramsey Fargala, and Yosef Sultani. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. So good Thank to you. Be here. So good to have you all on the lunchroom. This is super exciting. We love having guest hosts and we love This Is Who I Am. So we're just very excited for this conversation. Uh, I'm going to do what I do best every week. I'm going to go off camera, but I'll be here waiting in the wings if you need me and have a good conversation, y'all. Thank you, Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Evren Ochkin. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, one of the producing partners for ART on this production. And today I get to play host with two of my favorite people um, who sort of put up with me as we try to figure out how to do a digital live theater play, an actual play every night from their homes uh, <laughs> at the end of last year, which feels like a whole other time. This was before vaccines were rolling out. Um, you know, it, it was, there was real, um, not that we have too much clarity right now, but there was real lack of clarity around where we were going, how we were going, what we were doing. And uh, they jumped in. And uh, I hope you've either seen the show or you will, because their work on this production is absolutely gorgeous. So uh, I'm going to uh, pass it along to the two of you gentlemen. Ramsey, let's start with you if you want to introduce yourself. Oh, um, hi, I'm Ramsey Faragala. I'm, I'm an actor. I'm happy to be here today with both of, both of you lovely gentlemen. Hello, my name is Yusuf Sultani. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm an actor with uh, tan skin, five o'clock shadow. Uh, ha my hair is 
<clears throat> black and about shorter length, but tied back in a, in a uh, bun. And uh, I'm in Northern Virginia right now in Vienna, Virginia. I was going to ask you, Steph, if you were still in Virginia. And Ramsey, I'm assuming you're home in New York. Yeah, I am. Steph, and right. I'm calling in from Ashland, Oregon on the West Coast. So just those three cities should give you a sense of uh, some of the complications one faces with live production in the digital age. Um, we always like to joke that um, uh, Rachel, Albert, our very, very hardworking and incredible stage manager who is actually the reason this whole thing happened. Oh I would like God. to say <laughs> we are a hard bunch to wrangle and he, she did it beautifully and gracefully. Um, she was remarkable. With such generosity of spirit, she would call breaks uh, in six different time zones because our playwright, <laughs> Amir Zouabi, uh, was in Sweden for a while and then ended up in back in Palestine. Diane Berger, the ART producer, was in London. So uh, we had Joe Hodge from Minneapolis calling in as our dramaturg. So it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it was a it just actually getting to feel connected to folks from all over the world in a way was one of the joys of this. Um, I'm going to start with the personal question, which is so, such a hard one to answer these days. But how are you two doing? in this crazy moment of like a little bit of hope or over the horizon with uh, theater artists feeling like maybe there's a possibility of something in 21. How are, uh, where are we at? Uh, I will say, I will start by saying that I am exhausted <laughs> uh, by the uh, carrying the hope forward. Having said this, it's been, uh, we're sort of just starting the process of actually imagining what might happen in 21 and the idea of, saying yes to artists right now is making me feel the warm fuzzies and quite hopeful. How are you two doing? Oh, um, I'm thanks. Uh, it's still mixed. You know, I, yeah. I felt like, um, working together with you guys, um, and R Rachel, it was like, it was a, it was very buoying for me. It was, uh, it was a lot of work and it was so welcome. Um, and that was a really, that was like a high point pretty much for me for the last, you know, six, eight months or really the year. But there's a, I mean, if I'm going to be honest about it, just the last, the last month has been tough. Um, even though there's all of these positive things and I'm, you know, I'm, got my vaxes and all that stuff and my kids and my wife and my dog are doing well um i don't know oh, who's the um the actor in jaws robert shaw mm -hmm. there, he has this great monologue about um when he got into a i guess he was a, a navy man and i think he was on the in indianapolis or indianapolis um anyway he tells this great story a horrible sad great story of all of the crew members hundreds of them just floating in the water and uh the sharks picking them off and he said he was okay with it until like the last few minutes before somebody actually the boat showed up and fished him out of the water and i i feel like yeah. that's sort of where i think i'm at even though i'm struggling against it and i'm trying to pretend that there's not a there's not still a despair but, but they're you know but i'm very blessed mm -hmm. i'm very blessed but I'm still, if I'm going to be honest with my emotional state, there's, there's a, there's been a cost, you know? Yeah. Thank you for the honesty, Ramsey. I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Yusuf? Um, it's still a very strange time. Um, I think for a lot of people, I still, I know I, it's, it's funny because I've, um, I've decided to move back to Chicago. So for me, it's, um, it's been like the process of, because I, I used to live in Chicago for 10 years and then I came home um, at the end of 2019 and uh, to be with my family and then, you know, kind of stayed during the pandemic and then didn't plan on being in Northern Virginia as long as I have been, obviously. Um, and so now I'm, I'm getting ready to make that move back to Chicago and uh, just the idea of leaving my family after what we've been through is, is difficult. But it's also part of it's like, um, you know, I'm excited as well but tentatively you know i'm just i'm hesitant to 
to really be very excited. There's been a lot of um, faders who have reached out to the agency and asked me if I had availability to do shows, which to me is a good sign, but also I'm still very hesitant to accept any of those roles in the theater setting. And some of them are like next year, you know, early next year, or even later this year. Um, but I have been doing a lot of auditioning, which for me feels like a return to a sense of norm- normalcy in my profession. Mm-hmm. Um, because I mean, this week alone, I've done like, I don't know, like, <laughs> like eight auditions um, and like voice recording stuff and things of that nature. So I'm busying myself professionally, which is great. Cause it, you know, this show was one of the only things um, that I really had during the time. I did a couple commercials and stuff over Zoom, <laughs> oddly enough, and some voiceover things. And but like this was like a very creative and meaty and and, and beautiful and poignant piece that I really got to um, dive into, which I, I loved. You know, um, this play and being able to work with you guys. And so for now, like I'm along. I'm, I'm with Ramsey. I'm, there's I'm still still scared you know i'm still very very protective of my family i'm still i wear a mask everywhere i go i still don't see a lot of people um and it's funny because uh i got to this point during this pandemic where i started having dreams where i was seeing people and in my dreams i realized i was freaking out that no one was wearing masks and so it's really like seeped into my subconscious now when i notice people without masks or if i see people around me without masks. They're just like larger groups of people. I'm still, I feel like it's going to take me a while to really to get used to it again. I'm welcoming the idea of it. I am, but it comes with hesitancy. That makes you know? a lot of sense to me. I mean, it's, it's, I, I actually, you know, uh, at OSF, we're sort of starting the conversations around if we might be able to do something outdoors, all these things. And I actually have such a hard time even with masks, even with social distancing, what it's going to feel like to be in a space experiencing something together with people. I think it's going to be incredibly moving. I get kind of emotional imagining it. Um, But it's just, you know, we've sort of lost that part of ourselves and it'll be really interesting to connect back to it. And the thing you all said about this project and I want to share with the audience is, yeah, I've, I've talked about this play like a huge reminder of who I am. Because I feel like a lot of people assume theater artists, like it's what we do, right? Theater. But I I should speak from an I statement. It's who I am, actually, is a theater maker. So when that got removed in such a significant way, the whole industry shutting down, um, there was a whole part of me that felt sort of inaccessible. And with the two of you in these little Brady Bunch squares for you know, a month and a half for me and then onward for you all during the performance. um, It was actually like, oh, this is, I remember who I am. And that feeling of that reminder has been really moving even after. It's And the idea that now the show is back and then it gets to be shared globally again is is just kind of a joy. Um, Mm -hmm. On that note, um, so... Yusuf, the two of us have done a show together before, so at least I know how tall you are and your full being. Ramsey, we've never, we can't remember if we've actually met. And I don't think we have ever. Yeah, I've seen you in shows, so I have a theoretical idea of how tall you are. But, and the two of you haven't met, is that still, is that true? No. No, yeah, we've never been in person. I'm just going to put my hand up to the glass and try and touch you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And how does that, I I mean, uh, I'm so curious about sort of creating the kind of intimacy and history you two were able to create together. How was it different working in this medium and how was it the same? I'm always really curious about that, especially for actors, because your work is so personal and intimate. Hmm. I, um, we had, please go ahead. After you, sorry. No, no, no please. You, okay. Um, the thing that was so striking with the process is, um, you know, there's no way of getting to know the other person, um, other than the work. Like, uh. we're working and we have a break and then our screens go, we shut our cameras off and, mute and then deal with life 
And all of those little tiny splinters of time, like you show up early for rehearsal and then you start some bantering with somebody that, you know, who's in the cast. Um, Yusuf and I, we didn't have that real um, personal intimacy or like going out for a drink afterwards or, you know, there was no small talk. It was all the work. I felt like, you know, with Rachel, who was such an integral part of this, um, she was, um, she was like a great denominator. She like, like everything sort of went through her and she was so good at what she did. And so good, I would say with us, but she was certainly wonderful with me. Like if I had, I could small talk with her on texts and stuff. And, but all the real stuff, all of the, like between, you know, on our breaks. And like I said, after the show, that's all gone. And, um, and that I didn't recognize how important all those little pieces of, of, of personal humanity shared made such a difference. And, but the thing that was the same was having a, uh, um, a play that was so personal, like Amir's skeleton, well, not skeleton, the play was the skeleton that Yusuf and I, um, I think, I won't speak for you, Yusuf, but um, his play was the skeleton of our relationship. So we only got to know each other through the play which was so strange and lovely um but i've never had both of those things so separate before that's interesting yusuf how was it for you in terms of I, I this really, weird thing I, I, I completely agree with with ramsey in the sense of not that time away from the scripts when you have like breaks in between or, or you see each other before you leave or walking into the room together the room being like the actual space of rehearsal has always been very important to me and the relationships that happen there, that closest, that connectivity and that chemistry that's built there. But just a, a testament to how good you are as a director ever. And I think what helped us at least help me very much was the table work and how intimate it was to be in this box and be able to look at each other like this, but also realizing that like, the box hindered us as well sometimes, well, for obvious reasons. But in the sense of, like, I remember Ramsey and I having these issues where, um, in the theater sense, you could have your back turned and be speaking to somebody and having a very intimate moment or, or even not, not looking them in the eye. But so much of that was lost when we were doing it um, on camera. If one of us was, you know, emoting or, or, or going through a monologue or, or, or a speech that was very you know, or needed a, an answer to a question. And if we weren't, if that eye contact wasn't there um, for this, it felt, it felt fake and forced. Um, so that was a very big challenge for me to get used to this medium in that regard. Mm -hmm. And also just not occupying the same space, you know, and there's this beautiful thing about theater that's unlike any other art form. And there's this study done in Europe um, a few years back. I remember reading this, which stuck with me where, um, the audience's pulse and heart and rhythm, they start to synchronize while watching a play. And there's nothing else in the world that does that <clears throat> besides maybe watching a piece of orchestra. And so the entire audience is on the same wavelength with their heartbeats and done this wonderful study and scientifically proven. And that's something that's lost in this space. I don't think just that, but like things that are very similar to that are, are lost in that, in that, that it's, the best part about this, you know, one reason why I wanted to do this show was because we did it live. <laughs> I love the fact that it's streaming. And I love the fact that more audiences are able to see this performance uh, because it is such a well-written show and, and so beautifully put together by all of our designers and people who worked on it. But like there, for me as the artist, having getting the chance to do it every night and having it be live and, and the mistakes happening and technical difficulties and all that exciting stuff that comes along with theater was present for me. So there were things that we gained and, and things that we lost in this process. But I think that we made the best of it in, in, in the way that we possibly could during a, a pandemic. Um, you know, so the process was unlike any I've ever had before. 
but it was beautiful in its own right. It's such I'll an interesting... Say, oh, Ramsey, go for it. I was just going to say there's one more thing. One of the things that worried me was that um, after the show, I know we, we all spoke about this, but I was like, one of the things that worried me is like, once we're up and running, you, you leave, and we had all sort of relied on you so much um, to keep us all together. And then, like, you leave, and then the show's over, and then our our feed goes out, and that's it. So you, like, every night in a, in a theater, you know, you, the lights go out, you take your bow, and you run backstage, and you say hello and thank you to all of the stagehands and all that stuff. And as you're taking your wigs off and putting your stuff, you have this interaction with all these people. And then you, you get to go back to your dressing room and banter with your, you know, or, or if it's somebody who's of a different gender and they have a different um, uh, room, you know, you're shouting through the hall. There's all of this stuff. Oh, I loved it when you did that thing. Or, Hey, you know, tomorrow night, you know, there's all that, this weird decompression that happens. But I was like, the idea to do the show and then it's gone. I was like, oh my God, that, that, I was like, that's going to be like a throat punch every night. Yeah. And um, I think it was Rachel that was like, okay, so why don't you guys just leave your cameras on and we'll all clean up together and I'll take notes. And if anything came up that we need to discuss, we'll do that. And I just thought that was so great Um, because we were, you know, whatever it took us 30 minutes so we all sort of like uh uh uh, uh okay i'm all finished i'm gonna say good night see it. what time's the call tomorrow you know so yeah. there was that reach out for a normalcy after that and that was so valuable to me i have to agree i mean that was the funniest experience for this project was how things that are super easy in the theater had to be formalized here right so like yeah. the kind of stuff that it, um I actually had to do so much thinking as the director to be to create space for personal conversation and allow us to sort of meander and not have to go back to the work right away when we come back from break because that thing that you count on and you know you also do a great deal of direct, directing on the breaks right like the thing that you can't give formally as a note but like can just kind of pull <laughs> yourself aside and just whisper in his ear here, there's no whispering in Yusuf Seer without everybody knowing that I'm like talking to, you know what I mean? It's um, So we had to sort of build formalized social time, formalized wind down time. That was something Rachel and I talked about a lot is the play is you all put your heart out there and it ends in this really beautiful, but like something really happens. And the idea that you wouldn't have be together to come out of that back to your lives i was like that's not gonna work um the other thing i was going to reflect and yusuf thank you so much for mentioning that the whole eye contact thing and for the those in the audience i think this might seem really technical but you know when you see a film it's actually a very technical acting exercise right you're hitting your mark and you can the director can sort of shape the process through editing so that even if the actor is not feeling the connection with the other performer through editing, I can make it look like they are connected, right? Whereas this was theater on film, which meant y'all actually had to feel it all the time. Or because it's so such close up, we know it's fake. And that was, I remember both of you at different times being like, he's not looking at me. And it's like, yeah, no, but he's listening. We can tell. You're like, no, I can't tell. <laughs> and I have to be able to tell that he's listening to me. So it was this really interesting, I, and I really appreciate it, I have to say from both of you, how honest and open you two were with regards to your needs in the process because you were doing so much. Um, in terms of you doing so much, um, there are these videos, if folks have not seen it, go on. I'm sure they're on the ART uh, social media channels of both of you, uh, Ramsey, your setup photo, and Yusuf, you have that sort of set up, setting up your, for your house. Thankfully, we had two very handy uh, actors. We did not cast you for that reason, but it turned out that way. Um, what was that process like in terms of working through being your own production assistant and set dresser and 
uh, cook and dishwasher and, and, and. Um, what was that process like for you? Uh, did you know you said yes to all of that when you said yes to this show or did we trick you a little bit? Well, originally I was um, told that I would be having, I would have someone come and, and they would set up a space. Um, I would, my family and I would be, my set was in my garage. Uh, thankfully we had a sink in there and a fridge in there and, um, we use that space and change that to make it look like a New York style uh, apartment. Uh, thanks to our amazing designers. A lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was such a, an odd thing to like, it was, it felt like Christmas every day. Cause I was always getting packages and like boxes delivered and costumes and set pieces and, and then big things of like technical, you know, computers and, and, and wires and, and so many things constantly to keep track of. Um, so for me, I mean, God, this is just the testament to how great Ramsey is. I just had a space to put it all into, you know? So I'm glad I had my garage that like, I could be like, nobody come in here. You can't, you know, just don't worry about this space. I'm using it for the next few months, but you know, Ramsey had to use his actual home. Um, but I, the, the process of, 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 of building that thing and building it in the sense that like just putting things on the wall and taking things off the shelves and, and putting up light fixtures, you know, thankfully the, um, uh, the crew um, from William Mammoth came and they, and they built me the the island that I use for for the show. Um, I didn't expect to do that, obviously, because I was told originally that someone was going to be coming to do that. At like a week and a half, two weeks before we're going to tech, my brother tested positive for COVID. And so he quarantined. And I happened to be in Chicago at the time. So, uh, you know, I had this conversation with Maria, uh, uh, the artistic director of William Mammoth, and and, and she conferred with all of the other artistic directors as to what would be the best course of action. So I drove back instead of flying. And I stayed in the hotel for a few days. Well, I remember. Um, during that <laughs> time, my, my brother was being tested until he could test positive. So my mother got out of the house. And then, and then I told the, uh, Marie and everyone, and they were on the same page, that I, I don't think I'd feel comfortable with someone coming over now that someone, one of my family members had it just because I don't want to you know, put anyone else in danger in that regard. And thankfully, my brother tested negative by the time um, we had to start our tech, but we moved our, if you both remember, we had to move our previews back. Yeah. And then I think uh, the overall affected our opening night. Um, and, you know, these theater companies were so amazing. They had the foresight to think, it's not, it's not if someone in this production is going to be affected by COVID, it's when, you know? Yeah. So everyone was, was wonderful in the sense that they like made things malleable and we moved things around and... Uh, so that's when I had to step in and just be like, you know what, just send me the supplies and, and, and we'll zoom with, with, um, Tim was, uh, helped me, um, they, uh, the, the production manager, um, crew manager of, uh, of Wooly Mammoth, he came in and, and we zoomed together and for a whole day, uh, two days, um, I basically put this, this set together, uh, like laminating them. <laughs> oh, the amount it of time that took was so frustrating. Like. It, it looks so, so good, good though. you know? Yeah, it's crazy. It was such a such a good process. And, you know, I, I will say the fact that I was so hands-on in so many aspects of this play, from production to cleanup to costuming to... Uh, the, b- both of us were all of us, obviously, but, like, into my own space, it made it feel so much more like my own hmm. piece. You know, I had invested so much into it physically, mentally, emotionally, that, like, that you know, we nurtured it from start to finish. And um, I think that made this play even more special, you know? So that Ramsey, was my your, Yeah, no, that's amazing. Ramsey, your, uh, what the audience needs to understand is Ramsey's home, the kitchen is beautifully, lovingly built. <laughs> it's this fancy, gorgeous, so beautiful woodwork kitchen and we had to spend all this time and energy to make it look like a rundown kitchen in Palestine. And Yusuf was in his garage and we had to spend all this time and energy to make that look like a very high end loft New York kitchen in a weird way. If y'all were, well, we would switch, switch. It. <laughs> you would have to do no set dressing whatsoever, which was, you know, Mariana Sanchez, our scenic designer. I just and have to, Becca. You know, and Becca, the, who prop, the um, prop master. I just have to say the two of them, uh, I, I still to this day don't understand how y'all did it. It was, I would show up every day 
and it would just keep looking better until it looked the way it did for the show. But Ramsey, what was it like for you? Oh, that guidance. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, Ramsey, yeah. like, I feel like I know your family, although I like, <laughs> they know you took too. over your kitchen, and you know they would sort of gracefully go around the back to try to get food in the middle of our rehearsal without doing too much. But yeah. what was it like having your artwork live so central to your home? I can't tell you what it was like for them because it was a huge yeah. like the kitchen is central to the house just because we're that's the way i i built the house um so we had to we built a second kitchen in the living room i bought a refrigerator you know a small refrigerator and a hot plate and all that stuff so it was hilarious and they were so patient yeah we did part of it while the kids were at college and then they came back for the holidays um so they were here in the midst of it all and um they were it was really nice. I thought that they knew a lot about what I did because they've always sort of been involved and would always come see the shows or come to in the rehearsals. But um, I think that they they have a whole other understanding as opposed to just what you see on stage. Mm -hmm. um, they they get it all, and my wife. I just, I leaned on her so hard and she was always there. Um, it, it was really, that was really nice, but it really took over the whole house pretty much all week. You know, I, it took me, I think I got it down to an hour 20 for setup and then about 45 minutes after the shows to break it all down to get, and the weekends when we had the afternoon shows, I had to block out all of the windows, not just in the kitchen, but anything that shed light into that edge of the house because it's all glass all it's the way around. The middle of the night, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But the other thing was that uh, I just wanted to. I'm so appreciative of 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 Maria and of Becca because Maria would, you know, this is what I need, um, and you know we. I drew up plans for the house, the kitchen and gave them to her. And then she came up with all these things. And I was like, well, this doesn't seem right to me. And she's like, well, what do you want it to be? And like for Becca, I just asked for a couple of, not a couple, I asked for a lot of, it was, it's so prop heavy. It and is. Yeah. It's a cooking like, show. What Yusuf was saying is like, my basement was just filled with boxes upon boxes upon boxes of stuff. But I remember Becca, I said, I want an old, um, wooden handled knife and she, she just kept sending me these pictures i was like that's the one i want and i think she got it off of etsy and then i put a new edge on it and it was it, and because like that and i remember this coffee cup that becca and maria and i mariana like, yeah yeah mariana um uh we went back and forth with and they were just so generous um with me getting something that like felt right in my hand or smelled right or it was and like the the cover for the the table is mm -hmm. was just right on the money. It was and, so horribly perfect. <laughs> yeah, know? I mean the thing that's so funny about it is uh, the one uh, there was a lot of you know this is a really beautiful Palestinian story, and we all know like a lot of Palestinian stories don't really get told in mainstream American theater, and to have to get to tell the story, Ramsey, you are of Palestinian descent, Yusuf, you're Afghan. Um, I'm Turkish. So like in different ways, we have our own experiences of our stories not really being centered much in this art form that we do. But this one, having five theaters work on it of such caliber was also, if there was a like amazing takeaway from this pandemic is that that could happen. Um, yeah. And the thing in terms of specifics of it, and this is where I have to give props to the ART production team, the salt if you remember, there's a real specific moment where the salt is really important. The palace, you know, the salt in Palestine, which is an Israeli, Israeli brand. Um, and I remember we were looking at all these different salts and it's just not right, not right. And Amir, who's our playwright, who's a Palestinian, was like, it's not right. And finally, the ART props master handmade <laughs> multiple different like boxes of the actual Palestinian salt that we had to use for the play. And I remember thinking, this is, this is theater, like that's that in ingenuity and that sort of commitment to 
that specificity of character and the fact that everyone on the tech team was really just, of course, we have to do that. You know, there was never like, oh, you're asking for too much. There was just sort of a, it was such a beautiful team of yes people, right? Like they were always yes anding our ideas in a way. And even though this is such an unideal way to make theater, it also sort of opened our worlds up to so many different professionals from all over the country who were as committed as we were. And remember what, what James was able to get his hands on, the sound designer. Oh, right. I, 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 yeah. I, don't, I guess he knew somebody that lived in Ramallah. Mm-hmm. And after explaining or knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and he made contact with that person. And the person's like, oh, okay, well, why don't I just put the, uh, it's not a Nagra anymore, but whatever the sound yeah, the recording mic. device was just in my window. And I'll just record, I'll record a, the sound of the, um, of the street in Ramallah, in the neighborhood where it's supposed to take place for two hours. And you get the helicopters and you get the, the mopeds and you get the dogs barking and all that stuff. And I just, I was like, oh, that's just so good. And I'll say one other thing too, a prop that, um, that I think Becca made or, or, or Mariana, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who it was, but they spent hours on getting the right, um, milk container. Yes. (laughs) That was Becca. I think I'm pretty sure that it was great. And then she's like, well, you can't, the, the ink is all, well, you know, just, it'll all just bleed if it gets the least bit wet. So I took the whole thing apart and then I, I covered it with this, this spray clear plastic. So then it yeah. became waterproof and it was great, but like, I don't know, it was just a, like, I could get it wet. I could re-rinse it out and, yeah. and I didn't have to worry about it, but she sent me like nine copies of the box. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, and people a, work their butts off. That is the, actually the one thing I have to say. And this is, we all know this um, in the theater that the crew and the, the 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 folks behind the scenes are the real MVPs of any production. They are there early, they're there late. Y'all had to take on so much of that. And I just have to say you took it on with such grace and sort of generosity and like really you two were also real yes and people in this process because uh, you know, it was a moving target. This was, I have to say, this was one of the first actually highly produced live theater productions out there, like in the country. So it was all from the back end of how the streaming, you know, was working. And having to move, remember at some yeah. point in time, there was a uh, uh, an out, uh, there was an outage from, I don't remember what our... And- oh yeah, we had to move our... Um, uh, we were supposed the to be center. our command center was supposed to be at Woolly in DC, and then the internet could not actually handle the streaming, so we were able to secure a space in Baltimore. So yeah, but, I mean that was during the show's audience that you either have seen or will be seeing. That uh, there's an actor in upstate New York, actor in Northern Virginia, our stage managers in downtown DC, DC. and um, our command center where the thing is being run from is in Baltimore. So that was actually the every night. That but, was the communication. But at one point, I think it was our our our, our tech guy, was it is his name Mark? I've forgotten. Um and Ido, Ido and Alec, after the show switched everything over there. Mm-hmm. I think Ido was in he's in Brooklyn. But yeah. um our our sound guy and Alec took everything, drove it to Baltimore and set everything up and then they the three of them or maybe more spent the whole day uh, yeah. getting it ready for the show. Yeah. No, it's, it's you a, can't say no when people are doing that, you know, I it, mean, it people so, do, but I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, you know, you, know, you two are getting, um, just because we have some really great questions in the chat. So yeah. I actually want to, um, ask you a few of these, um, did the show, uh, Ryan McKittrick is asking, um, did the show evolve over the course of the run and how? Um, yes, I think it did. And um, I think it was really the performances. I think we, um, well, I, I won't speak for you, Yusuf, but I really learned um, how to pitch the show uh, or to act it. Because we were really acting 
for the, I was really acting for the theater. Um, and there are some times where there's like seven exclamation points after a line and you can't, the way I was doing it does not come across correctly on screen. And I think the other thing about uh, the, uh, the eye contact was a big uh, mm -hmm. thing, but everything could be so much smaller um, and still read very clearly and very naturalistically as you can't really, I, I don't know. And I remember we, we recorded an early version of the show and then we were, we got a chance to see it. And I was, uh, that was sort of crushing to be honest, because the show, as I think, as you said, you saw, that wasn't the show that we were doing later in the run. Um, uh, so because I was able to see part of that, Mm -hmm. capture i didn't realize how it had changed until then what do you think you saw i completely agree with you i think most shows generally yeah. tend to evolve a bit it's a journey you know so it, where do you start isn't necessarily the same place that you finish and, and and once our director has given us all the direction he can it falls on us then these to find these moments and new things and, and intricacies between us. And I definitely think we found those. And I think the point you just made, Ramsey, is, is actually very spot on as to how how much it had evolved. I mean, I, I was thinking about this when watching because I did I, I watched the stream um and I do recall I remember watching our first recording, um, which I believe was one of our previews. It was preview, like it was yeah. before we had opened even. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So and 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 so much just from just from the first preview to when we opened had changed quite a lot, as as the show does. I just remember having a lot more angst and and like frustration uh, as the sun first of that that evolved into something different by the end of it through um everyone's direction and, and I, I was really pleased with where our show ended up and that and that show that 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 everyone's hopefully getting a chance to see now and if they haven't already um is uh is is exactly where i would have wanted it to be and, and i'm glad that we got to that point um but you know the the process of the show changed for me immensely as it continued on you know and, I, and i'll be honest as both of you guys know you know i um my father passed away at the end of 2019. And so for me, like this show is very cathartic and therapeutic at times, but you know, I think by the end of the run, it had really started to take its toll on me. And I didn't realize how yeah. much until, um, um, you know, we had some family things and, and lost, uh, during the production that I had a really, really hard time with. Um, and if anything, if I was doing anything else, I, I don't think I would have been able to continue, but I think I was just, I felt like I was in such a safe place with Ramsey and, and our, um, and Rachel and, uh, that I was, you know, not that I use any of that stuff, but I just, after the show, sometimes I would just turn the camera off and just, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to say that it didn't seep into my performance a little bit because it was so, but son and I have very, very similar parallel lives in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, and I've said this before, Rams reminds me a lot of my dad, just physically. Um, mm -hmm. and so for me, I thought I was ready to do it and I was ready, but the process of the show and the doing it every night and reliving that trauma for myself started to, you know, poke cracks into me. So I think the show for me, when it ended, when it did, um, was at the right time. Because yeah. I think any any longer of a run or any any more time, I think it would have actually affected my performance and and me to a greater extent. Um, but you know, having come out of that and having done this show, looking back, it was exactly what I needed at mm. the time. You know, and and I'm so grateful to you, Everin, for casting me in this piece, and I'm so grateful to all of our artistic directors and the theaters that that hopped onto this because it was it's really one of the more important plays that I've ever done in my life because I have such a, a deep rooted connection to it for a multitude of reasons. Um, and yeah, I love this show. So I'm happy to be able to revisit it after this amount of time. Yeah. I do believe that, um, plays sometimes find you when you need them. I, I actually am a little bit, you know, very California that way. Um, in the, so this play for me as well, my mom passed away from cancer many years ago at this point, six, seven years ago. Um, 
and I, you know, have processed it as one does, but then just the process of these two men finding the, remembering the joy of their mother or their wife rather than their, the, the, the horribleness of the loss of her. Um, I had no idea what a gift that was going to be to me in a way in the driver's seat of sorts and not really putting myself through it, but it was a really, really beautiful process. And I have to say, um, this was a big experiment, you know? So I wasn't sure if we were going to make anything good. And I remember when Maria asked me to do this, I was like, this could be terrible. You know, like, I don't know if you can do the, this kind of play with this level of emotional connection and depth in little boxes. I, I just didn't know, you know? So I do have to say, I do feel quite proud that it was very impactful for me, but I do agree with both of you. I could see the ways in which it was impactful for the two of you. And I think that really came across for the audience. And it felt like art, you know, like it felt like there was art being made and it wasn't just, a, you know, like a thing that happened on Zoom. So, and that felt really, really um, important to me. I do want to share, um, Eric Bailey asks, post-pandemic, do you see yourself in another virtual production? And do you think that virtual theater is here to stay? I don't see why not. I mean, one of the great things about this was that people got to see it from all over the world. I mean, even people out of state or um, that could never see it if it was only simply uh, a theater piece in a theater. I think that's one of the wonderful things about so much... Um, so much of the art that's now being done not just on zoom and you know quite frankly our yourself and i interacted on zoom but what the audience sees is a much higher production value than what zoom is yeah. you know the lights that it was designed and all the sounds and and everything it was it's it's a much better thing than just a zoom reading but I have seen some really great um, stuff on, I guess, on screen. So I would love to be able to see other productions um, if they're captured well and, and edited well and lit well and there's good sound. Sure, why not? Um, and I also think that even probably for the next year or so, there are going to be people who don't choose or don't think it's safe to for them to go into a large, a large group of people again, laughing and, and, and yelling and weeping. Um, so I think it's, it's a nice thing to have on the menu of shows. Uh, will we, whoever it is, will you have a, um, a production of a show and then two weeks into the run, you have two productions where you have, a, uh, uh, I mean, you have two performances where there's a film crew. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a much. It's a big expense and and whatever. But I I think it's wonderful, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that we were able to recapture the show. Yeah, no. I have to say that is a real gift. Uh, that the, I mean, theater is so ephemeral, right? Like we are yeah. all used to making this, the, working our asses off for so long, and then it happens, and then you let it go in a way. So yeah. I, I'm so. And, you know, whenever theater is really captured, it doesn't always, unless you spend a great deal of money, as you said, Ramsey, you don't ever yeah. actually capture whatever that live magic of the audience that the audience experiences is. Um, you can, it just requires a lot of resources and energy and some smart people almost redoing and the show for the camera. Exactly. The idea They're that the art I've made has, is, is now there for perpetuity and that, like, it can come back like this and can be a moment in time sharing of it is, you know, I'm not used to this as a theater director. It actually feels like mm -hmm. a real gift to me in a weird way. Um, Yusuf, the, 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 what about you uh, in terms of doing other digital theater? I know you do a lot of TV, you know, like uh, uh, that kind of camera work as well, but for digital theater. Okay, yeah, this was, this was so, this was so different than that because it was, it was acting for theater 
on camera, which for me are two completely different mediums. You know, um, as an actor, when you're acting on stage, you generally need to be bold and bigger so that you can have the 800 to 1,000 people in the audience be able to pick up on your expressions. And on film, you know, you really have to tone it down because the camera is about this big. And especially if you're on film, you're, you're the raise of an eyebrow in a 75-foot screen an IMAX has a lot, you know. Um, so finding that medium, uh, finding that, that, that balance in this was, was very tricky. Um, and I remember you telling me a couple of times, you're like, you, you know, you're not in the theater. You have to tone it down. Yeah, you can't scream. Because, uh, There's no screaming on Zoom. Because, you know, I wish you're going to blow our ears out. But in this, but for, for the sense, for the sake of the art, you know, I think we were forced to find new avenues and new ways of creating. Because, uh, you know, that's what we do as humans. We tell stories. And I'm, and I think it was a beautiful thing that this show happened and the way it did. I think Amir did a wonderful job in creating something that was able to be done over Zoom for that purpose in that sense where these two characters could interact and be, you know, there was blocking, we were cooking and having conversation. And it's, it's really engaging. And if work like that is happening, then I say yes, absolutely. It's beautiful and I would love to be a part of it because uh, I will never say no to art in any form. Um, but it has to be like in that sense for me. You know what I mean? One of the only reasons why I signed on to this project was one AU uh, to the script. I loved it. So and, and all these amazing theaters were on board and, and the way it was presented to me. I just, I just, I loved the idea and the concept because I'd seen, and I did a couple, you know, I'd, I'd done some stage readings and things. And, and there was times when I was asked to do Shakespeare over zoom. And to me, it's just, the language, yes, is beautiful, but I just, I don't find it engaging as enough. So for me, there's nothing that replaces the theater, um, truly. And, and, and this is and not replacing theater. I just think it's a different, a different medium that we've found and, and are able to use. Um, and so I do productions in the future. If the work presents itself, if work presents itself in the manner that it did like this, then absolutely. Yeah. If I have a connection to it and I feel it, then, then I'd love to do another play like this. But, you know, stage readings over Zoom and things like that, as necessary as they are, I, they're hard. You know, they're really hard um, to just, it's like being in a meeting. And, you know, after an hour and a half yeah. staring at a TV screen with multiple boxes, you get tired. And so that's, that's hard to consistently engage with, with viewership, especially people at a younger age with how often we're, you know, on our cell phones and only watch things for 15 seconds at a time. So um, do I think this is the way of the future? No. Do I think it's a great new venue that we've explored as artists and have at our fingertips now? I think, yes, it's great. Will I do things like that in the future? Possibly, if it's done the same way. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I have to say, and I'll answer, Christine Noah asked sort of what was it like to direct over Zoom? And I feel like I can answer this question in the context of this is, you know, I said no to everything up until this show. Because I feel like so much of the theater, which happens, I mean, you know, we're all, we were all just trying to figure it out. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, trying to make work that sort of felt like theater rather than making work for this format. And I realized for me, live was very important because that's why I said yes. Obviously the play, I adore Amir's writing. I've been, I've had an artistic crush on him for like years and years and years. And the idea that I could work with them and all these theaters was a big part of it, but it was also live. So the experiment that I was interested in as a live director, that turns out is the non-negotiable for me. Um, but the thing that's really moving about this is I love a big, challenge. I love not knowing how to do something. I'm usually saying yes to projects where there is something that feels impossible. And to be honest, this was that one, not just the technical aspect of it, but what is directing look like in this format? And I remember I was trying to direct you all for the first few weeks. I don't know if you ca caught this as if it was a film. I was like, Ramsey, you need to be in this corner, three inches to the left, and I need you to pull, put the salt exactly here. I was trying to frame everything, and it wasn't working, right? Y'all weren't, not that you, you were doing it, but it wasn't happening. And Daniel Washington, who's the festival producer at OSF, who was sort of um, talking to me after one of the rehearsals, he, she went, you know you're directing a documentary. It's not a film. 
they are living and the camera happens to catch them. So any framing has to be accidental. And it was just one of those, you know, like, I was like, oh my God, you are so, and then it was fine. And then I had the, I watched a couple of documentaries and then I had to like vernacular to be able to form the story because y'all have to live it. It's theater. You couldn't, of course you were paying attention to like you do in theater. You had to hit your light. You had to, you know, listen to the sound, respond to each other. You know, it's shaped, but it had to be connected for you. And if it couldn't be so minutely framed, because then the fake, the lack of authenticity is really clear in this format. Um, and then the last thing I will say for me is the, um, uh, it's the first play that my brother in Turkey has ever seen me direct in my 40 years of life. 20 something years of professional theater. Um, this was the first what one. What did he say? Uh, well, he doesn't speak English, which was hilarious. So he was up at like two in the morning watching a play in a language he doesn't understand. This will give you everything you need to know about my family. He, he gave me his opinions and notes about the show. <laughs> Although he doesn't speak the language. He was like, I like this. This didn't work for, I was like, you don't even know what happened. <laughs> Uh, my my poor niece was uh, who speaks English was translating for him live while it was happening. So, but yeah, no, it's um, he loved it. It was it was actually really moving for him because I think for him my career it has he's they're all very supportive, but it was all very theoretical. You know what I mean? Everett does that thing in the U.S. and this sort of made it real for them, which was a real gift for me. Um, and you know, and it. it the thing I will say to the audience is, you know, we are all experimenting in this moment as art makers. And as you see, Yusuf and Ramsey, myself, and the full crew that did this show, I hope what you'll get from the show is the love that was put into it and that it was a real piece of art and story that I personally feel was almost larger than all of us. And we sort of put it into this crazy format and put it in front of you. And I just hope that you will engage with it with that in mind, the love that's been put into the show and that you will continue to, because the artists are putting a lot of love into these little boxes as we figure out what's next. Um, and I really hope that our audiences stick with us uh, and, you know, just continue to receive the love we're giving with the generosity of spirit that is so um, true of theater audiences around the world. I, I feel like people come to the theater with love and I, you know, we're, we're bringing the exact same amount of love into these little boxes as we would if you were coming into our theater homes. So um, we're reaching the end of our time. I just want to give a big thank you to these two gentlemen who uh, were the highlight of my pandemic life over the <laughs> last year. And as I, every time I spend time with you, you continue to be the highlight of my pandemic life. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for this conversation. And I really, really hope that the show continues to receive uh, great audiences that the performances of the two of you really, really deserve. Um, and at this time, I'm going to invite Sarah back so that she can uh, do the closeout. Thank you all so much. This was such an exciting conversation. And as someone who's a big fan of the show, it was really awesome to hear a little bit all about your, your respective processes on it. So thank you so much for joining us today on The Lunchroom and sharing so candidly. Um, as always, we appreciate all of you at home who are watching. But for This Is Who I Am, we would like to especially thank all of our partner organizations, the Guthrie Theater, OSF, and especially the play company in Woolly Mammoth, who really led the way in this collaboration and brought us all together to make such an incredible piece. So thank you to all of our partner organizations. Thank you, Evren, for being an amazing host. And thank you, Yusuf and Ramsey, for being fantastic guests. I hope everyone has an opportunity to watch This Is Who I Am again or for the first time. Um, we look forward to seeing you at another virtual event shortly. So have a good day, everyone. Thanks for watching The Lunchroom. Bye, guys.